Boardroom Bound, Episode 59, The Challenges of Governing a Startup, with Francisca Isari. I had a huge marketing team by then, a PR team, an internal communications team. So, you know, I was supported everywhere. And, and then I go into an entrepreneurial environment where you have to do everything yourself and learn to do everything yourself and learn that cash is king. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Boardroom Bound. My name is Alexander Lowry, and this is the podcast dedicated to intentional leadership in the boardroom. My goal is to give aspiring and existing directors the tips, tactics, and strategies necessary to transform your confidence and build a successful career as a board director. Quick reminder, you can get all of today's show notes at podcast.gordon.edu. And with this episode, we're doing something special. We are doing a mini series on the skills matrix. This is something I really want all of our audience to understand because this is how boards fill their seats. They're evaluating who do we have today? What are the skills, the expertise, the competencies, and who do we need for the future to fill those next few spots? So what I want to do is introduce you over a series of several episodes to some good friends of mine who are specific skilled people and understand how those map back to a board who'd be looking for them. And it's directly translatable for everybody who thinks about how do they build their own position of authority, become known for something in a niche, and then figuring out what boards does that fit with and therefore go out and do the right networking to land the board seats. And in today's show, we're speaking with Francesca X-Ray, and she is an incredibly experienced executive and also an incredibly experienced board director. And we will hear how she made that transition, which is the situation for a lot of people listening to this podcast. Now she's on some of the big names that you would go, wow, that's impressive, like being a non-executive director for Air France, the giant airline. And we will hear how she took her expertise, her specialization, because she is a branding, a marketing, communications, digital expert. And she's also someone who is well steeped in the travel industry. How she took those two pieces, perhaps her pillars, if you want to think of it like that, and use that to leverage going forward and starting that board career. And then it took off from there. So we'll hear that personal story for her today. And then you can think about how that would apply for yourself. How do you position yourself accordingly? Now, I can't wait for you to hear this episode and think about how you can apply it to your own job search. Let's jump into the show. Francesca X-Ray, welcome to the Boardroom Bound podcast. Thank you. Delighted to have you here all the way over from France, where such a, the world is so small today with technology. That's great that, that we can share your story and bring your background expertise to people around the world. And I guess I would love to just start by hearing more about that, right? You don't become a Ned on Air France overnight. There's a lot of history and background and how you built up to it along the way. I would love if you could share with some of our audience, because of course, today we're looking at you as an example of someone who's specializing in things like marketing and branding and comms and digital. And that takes a lot of time and expertise to build up and become known for that. Maybe you can walk us through your career and how you got to this point. Uh, Yes, of course. So I started my career in the 80s as a management consultant uh, for McKinsey & Company. I worked first in Portugal uh, for two years, then in Spain, and then in the UK. And then I sort of moved to the Anglo-Saxon part of my career. Um, First, I went to business school um, at at Harvard Business School, and then I moved uh, back to Europe, um, focusing very much on consumer goods and marketing. That was something I very much wanted to do. That was also kind of the reason why I went and did an MBA, because in continental Europe, you can't really sort of have uh, um, a non-business degree uh, as an undergrad degree and then go and work into business. So, so I thought an MBA was going to give me those uh, um, tools. I um, started uh, with PepsiCo. I worked um, there both for my summer internship while I was at business school in, um, in, uh, in Dallas. But then when I moved to Europe, I, I, was, I was working in the UK. Um, and I have to say, from this point on, was I was very much UK-centric. But most of my career was in the UK, even though a lot of it was uh, international, uh, but basically coming back to the UK and sort of working out of there. So in the... Uh, 90s, I was basically a marketeer, 
started with a uh, marketing um, analyst, uh, um, assistant marketing manager, and sort of going up basically uh, on the various uh, uh, marketing, product management, brand management routes, um, a few years with PepsiCo, Pepsi Foods, and then um, into retail, working for Thomas Cook, which was retail travel, and then radio rentals, which is um, electrical appliances, where I was international marketing director, and then moved back into travel uh, for Going Places, which is a company, a big retail travel agent that now is owned by Thomas Cook as well. And I worked there all the way until... um, the early uh, sort of uh, 1999 where the dot-com boom was starting to happen Mm. and at the time when I was working in the travel industry we were were probably one of the first industries that embraced multi-platform distribution and digital distribution and first through point of sale in the shops but then uh, uh, migrating the technology into into online probably 10 years ahead of any other industry so um, it was quite bumpy but but loads of fun and um, in 1999 I was commercial and marketing director for a large uh, uh, travel agency group and I decided to take the plunge and go uh, entrepreneurial so I set up my first uh, um, dot com in travel in in 1999 uh, that didn't succeed because the bubble had just burst certainly in the UK had just burst the dot com bubble so that was uh, um, uh, quite stressful and coming from very large organizations where you had lots of support and, and I had a huge marketing team by then a PR team an internal communications team so you know I was supported everywhere I had a personal assistant who had a personal assistance so you can just imagine the amount of support I had <laughs> and um, and then I go into an entrepreneurial environment but where basically you have to do everything yourself and learn to do everything yourself and learn that cash is king and manage all that uh, so the first venture I had 16 people but that didn't work out I had to fold the second venture grew to 60 people where I managed to raise venture capital funding and had offices in four countries in the UK in London in Paris, in Denmark, in Germany, uh, uh, in Munich, and sort of was working again on another travel.com called If You Travel that was specializing in ski. And, and, and it was a, an amazing experience because we had the technology, we had the fun. And when I mean technology, you had to create the technology from your own bone marrow at the time. There was none of that open source stuff. You know, you had to do it yourself. So it was fairly stressful to create the technology, but very rewarding um, because um, at the time there was very few com- uh, competing websites that delivered a consumer, a customer centric um, execution to the, 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 the travel booking uh, uh, process, and we were one of the, the, the ones that were quite successful. So after a couple of years, we, we exited and we sold it to a listed business, um, which meant that the shareholder was very happy, and my, my team kept their jobs and the brand still exists today so you know everybody had a happy ending except for me because (laughs) because the business got absorbed into this um other venture so so um i then went back into corporate and continued as managing director general manager in the travel sector working for the number one student travel organization in the world called sta travel and i joined this was more or less an incubator business so even though I was general manager and, 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 and responsible for the p and I also had distribution through licensing and franchise partnerships um, initially in 42 countries and then developed the expansion to 79 countries six years later. So um, that was very much through digital, of course, because how, how, how else can you distribute in um, 79 countries uh, if it wasn't through distribution? Um, uh, through digital distribution. And after six years, I moved into a pure play uh, uh, digital travel uh, price comparison website called Cheap Lights Media. 
And there I worked for four years, first two years in the UK, and then moved more internationally, where we diversified very successfully from the UK to the US and then Canada, so that we have a nice uh, diversified revenue stream. And um, what brought me to then, at that stage, uh, wanting to develop a portfolio non-executive career is that actually, even when I was at SCA Travel, that was something I wanted to do. Uh, because those 11 years of being an entrepreneur and working in, 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 in travel and digital and, and, and technology um, uh, sort of was very, very operational. And even though it was huge amounts of, uh, of fun, it was also very challenging to do any type of strategy, despite the fact that I had to reinvent the business model a couple of times in both environments. So, so you, you spent a lot of time being operational and not enough time being strategic. And so I really fancied going back to strategy because effectively, you know, I started at McKinsey as a strategy consultant and, and I sort of wanted a, more of that in my life. And when I was at STA Travel, I did go and speak to my boss and I said, you know, I'd like to have a non-executive directorship. Is that okay? And he's like, you've got to be joking, right? You've got 79 <laughs> countries. Don't, don't you think you've got enough there? And, and I said, well, maybe you're right. So I didn't do anything then. Um, but when I went to Chief Flight, I said, right, I want to build it into my contract. So I did. I managed to build it into my contract, my employment contract, that I was allowed to do one non-executive directorship. But of course, when you're running P&Ls across, across oceans, there is just no way you can spend any time doing your, your self-promotion or, or even networking. You're basically based out of the duty-free shop. So it is absolutely impossible to do it that way. So when the opportunity arose for me to sort of leave uh, Cheap Flights Media, I thought, okay, fine, this is now the right time to 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 develop a, a little bit more of a footprint within the non-executive directorship community. And, and it was very interesting because um, it didn't happen easily. It didn't happen, obviously. Um, you know, I thought with 11 years of digital multi-platform distribution experience running companies, doing that successfully was going to be a good uh, uh, entry ticket. The fact that I had Harvard MBA, the fact that I worked for McKinsey for four years, that worked for Pepsi and Thomas Cook and things like that, I thought all that would, would open loads of doors for me. But actually, because I was abroad most of the 10 years prior to this movement, I really had to start from scratch. And I found it remarkably challenging. Um, and of course, it is very competitive as a space, but it was also very challenging because, um, you know, there I was at the top of my executive game being rejected left, right and center. And, and, and you know, I had to basically pivot and, and look at myself as a business and reposition uh, the skills that I have to offer and, and then sort of start marketing it until I got traction, basically. So that's how I ended up becoming a non-executive director. There's so much that we can unpack there, and this is a great way to start. And I'm sure our audience heard throughout that a lot of specialization. So, for example, we heard a lot about the travel industry, right? So we heard a lot about the the digital stuff, the marketing, the branding. And you could probably even just take those two strands and play it forward in your career and think, this is the space you can play. And you don't have to shop for a board role everywhere because this is probably how you're going to stand out. And I think this is a, a useful point for all of our audience. I'd love to, if you could explain that a bit more. Now, clearly, we can look at the end result and we can see Air France, we see that, well, that's an obvious and direct fit with what you've been doing. But just like you said there, it would have taken a lot of networking and branding and activity to get to that space. So what was it actually like when you decided, okay, now I'm going to plant my flag. Now I'm going to pivot. I want to be a portfolio of NED careers, which is what you have now. How did that actually work out? What were the steps that you went through to lead to that success? So the very first thing is to get a NED CV. Um, a NED CV is very different from uh, an executive CV. And, and, and sort of, because that's your calling card. And it needs to work very hard. It needs to have a really good elevator pitch. It needs to pull out your skills. And it needs to evidence them very, very quickly. Because effectively, your CV, you know, in any, 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 any situations, but your CV works the, the top 
the top half of the front page of your CV, that's the bit that is going to pull people in and to read the rest. So you need that bit there to work extremely hard. And and it wasn't it wasn't a, a, a slam dunk despite uh, 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 all my skills and everything i had to offer because the key is to communicate it and to make sure that it lands uh, uh, in an appropriate way at the right time and and i'm sure you've heard you have to be at the right place at the right time well actually in this situation you have to be everywhere uh, all the time which is fairly challenging which is why the cv needs to needs to stand on itself uh, uh, on its own right and be able to sell you and 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 to sort of open doors for you so it took me a while i had a couple of goes so of course i had my cv my executive cv which was the stuff i came out with harvard business school and you know every time i had a new job i would add it at the end and i would do a wonderful job and and you know because it was all about achievements and about being an executive and making things happen it was it, it, it was it, it worked for me, so I, I actually didn't get very many rejections in my life. That's why it was a bit of a shock when I got into this space to get so many rejections because you kind of need a, a strong nervous system to be able to navigate all this, um, especially as a woman, because at the time I thought, you know, you read everywhere, people want women. Well, yes, they do. They certainly want to meet them, but they don't give them the jobs. And if you look at the stats, you can see that there's very, very slow evolution. So as a woman, you need to, you, you need to do a lot more than, than I would say some of my fellow uh, 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 male board directors are able to get away with in terms of to get traction and to get noticed and to get hired. Um, so the net CV is very much the first thing, um, and you need to make sure that uh, uh, the skills that are required for uh, a non-executive director role are the ones um, that you will surface uh, 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 on your CV. So for me, is the fact that I've got digital multi-channel distribution strategy uh, skills, and I've got plenty of evidence. I've got 20 years worth of, of, of evidence, so you kind of mention it. The fact that I've got a lot of international experience, the fact that I've got an analytical and strategic background, uh, um, and that of course, I was a, 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 a director, a marketing director, albeit an executive director. But, you know, for, for a good few years before I was uh, 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 trying to be on the board as a non-executive director. So, you know, I knew how it worked from, from the executive point of view. Um, so all of that needs to surface in the first half of your CV. And then, of course, have a really punchy uh, um, elevator pitch, which will then get people to read more about what I've actually done in each of the jobs and all my achievements. Um, but the net CV is probably um, the, the game changer. Um, the first one I had, you know, I actually hired a, a CV writer. I spent quite a bit of money on it. I had a two-hour meeting, and they, uh, you know, a bit like, you know, net CVs are us, if you were. And, uh, and out came a CV, and I thought it looked great. I was, certainly they told me it looked great, and I didn't get a single meeting on the back of it. And the reason for it is because it was very unauthentic. You actually need to go quite a bit back researching into into your database, into all the things you've achieved in your work and life experience to be able to construct a net CV that is rooted in authenticity and actual facts uh, and not sound like every other CV that, that you see full of hackneyed terms that actually uh, don't give any particular evidence uh, for, for your claims. Um, so that's the CV. The second one is LinkedIn. And, and LinkedIn, for me, you really need to work it. And there is plenty of opportunities to, to, to make sure that it's right. LinkedIn is quite helpful. There are loads of YouTube and, and loads of uh, uh, um, sort of tips on how to make it work. But the key thing is to make it complete. And, um, and I remember I had like this discussion with this friend of mine who said to me, well, you know, everybody knows what Goldman Sachs is. I'm like, no, they don't. You need to go and explain what it is, you know, the size of it and the size of your responsibility. You need to actually give facts and figures because some people may not know and then they may be too embarrassed to go and ask you, like, well, what, what, what do they do? Because it may be that if you're an investment banker, you know all about it. But if you've been um, a sort of an astrophysicist, you may not. 
And yet, if you're the recruiter, you need to make sure that they don't have any questions so that it's all there in your CV and it's helpful um, or on your LinkedIn profile. And so... I, you know, I, I just think you have to, uh, once you've got your CV, you have to make sure you load it up LinkedIn. You have to connect to everybody that you know from all uh, uh, your, your contacts. So make sure that you only connect to people that you do know, um, but, but sort of start deploying your, um, your net and make sure that you're connected to, the, to, the, to your contacts, but to the decision makers, to headhunters, to wh- whoever are the multipliers in this process so that um, they can refer back to you, they can find you easily, and, and they've got the information they need about you very, very easily. And Francesca, and then, so if you've if you've built this great CV, which is sort of one half, and the other half is LinkedIn, sort of your push pull marketing, right? Because one people find yeah, you, the others you're you're sending it out to them, and you've documented and you built out this profile so people can understand your story. And for you, you've got this specialization as everyone's going to into certain areas, and you're thinking, okay, I need to find the right opportunities for me. I need to connect with them. And you told us earlier, uh, quite understandably, you've been traveling so much, you didn't have perhaps the local network that you wanted to and the place you needed it to how do you then actually go out and sort of of market and promote yourself in that specialized area so people can understand when I need this exact fit I got to go to Francesca she's the right person how do you take that forward so um, basically just like any other marketing campaign you sort of test it so what I did is on my elevator pitch I tested it so I went to all these networking events and I would and I would blurt out what, what I did because everybody was kind of looking for a job and, 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 and it's like what you're supposed to do. So off I went. And, and if the person on the other side starts frowning, saying, I'm not quite sure I understand <laughs> what you do, then there you have it. Then you know that you're not clear enough and right. you're not, get, you're not going to get any tractions. And then you pivot. You basically wordsmith it until the person you're speaking to saying, this is me and this is what I have to offer. These are the, the, the questions I'm the answer for. And the person on the other side says, oh, yeah, no, I know what you do. Oh, I've got a friend who does that. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yes, I, I. <laughs> so it's basically you just, that's what you use the networking event because it's not like at a networking event you're not going to convert and get a job right there and then, right? So you have to uh, use it uh, uh, and do it f- for a purpose. And for me, at the beginning, my purpose was to make sure that I, I articulated my professional DNA correctly so that people knew exactly what I had to offer. And then I went out and started uh, 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 sending it to recruiters. Um, the other thing is, is market mapping. You know, uh, uh, who would need the skills that I have and who would be uh, the recruiter in those scenarios? And I had quickly um, realized that uh, um, in the UK, we have a very, uh, uh, a very sophisticated corporate governance uh, uh, code for companies. Uh, but basically, only regulated companies follow that to the letter. And one of the, the, the requirements is diversity. So for me, it was quite an obvious thing to do is to network with list or try to get to listed, publicly listed on the stock market. Uh, we've got a couple. We've got uh, London Stock Exchange. We've got AIM, um, but also regulated by industry bodies. So, you know, Civil Aviation Authority, uh, the Energy uh, uh, Financial Conduct Authority. So there's a number of regulators uh, that require companies belonging to those environments to be uh, uh, governed uh, in my view, much better. And therefore, they will be seeking more diversity. And therefore, for me, it was the obvious thing to do is to go and try to contact listed and regulated businesses, which meant that I had to leave a little bit the travel specialism and focus on marketing and on the consumer side of things, consumer champion, digital distribution, and uh, um, digital uh, transformation and, and international development. So that was my pitch. That was the, the, the questions I'm the answer for because I thought that that could, in the market mapping, in my market mapping, I thought that that's where I was going to get any traction. And that's where I found traction. 
And what was it like when you started to get traction? So you've done all of this great research, you've done the, the, the testing, and you've maybe done some of the beta work. You talked about the networking group, and you think <laughs> you've got your plan to go forward. And talk us through what that's actually like and, and how perhaps lessons learned that you would give to other people wanting to follow in your footsteps, but you'd say, but I would do it a little bit differently this way with the benefit of hindsight. Well, I mean, you know, it, uh, by, by going into a new industry, uh, you are making it a bit harder on yourself because you have to learn everything about the company, everything about the industry, everything about the competitors and the lingo and the acronyms and all of that stuff, right? So you need to, you, 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 it, it does, does, does create more work, but it also makes it more interesting because it is fascinating. And, and part of what drove me to go into this non-executive director career is to learn about new businesses. And even Air France, even though it's travel, it is an airline business. And, and let me tell you, it's run very differently from a travel agency or a tour operator business. And it is fascinating. And the sheer size of it is absolutely sort of mind-blowing. You know, I mean, when you are just looking at how they transfer luggage from one plane to the other, and, and you see that actually there's like 36 kilometers of, 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 uh, of fast, uh, uh, um, uh, moving trays with all these luggage in it and, and nothing gets lost. I mean, you know, you're in awe. But that's kind of the, 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 the sheer size of these businesses. But I have to learn it. And even though I'm from the travel industry, an airline is very different from a travel agency. It's very different dynamics and you better learn everything. And what was it like as you began to think, I want to become a NED portfolio management career. Like that's what I want my new business to be. And clearly it's got to start somewhere. And hopefully it becomes like a snowball going downhill, gathers, gathers more and it becomes bigger and you get more opportunities. But getting that first one or two is probably the hardest part. If you're giving advice and guidance to our audience about here's how to begin, how to start, what are the practical steps in addition to what we've already talked about that you would recommend? Get yourself a, a, a good CV. Make sure make sure you work it on LinkedIn. Make sure you go networking into environments that are that that basically uh, are, have favorable odds. So you know there are networking events where everybody is looking for a job. That's not favorable odds because everybody's in the same situation as you. But there are other places like accountancy firms and 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 places where nerds hang out. Uh, that's where you need to go and network because that's where you will be able to um, first test your elevator pitch properly, but also sort of make connections and sort of start multiplying and get tips because anybody who sits on a board as a NED will have an opinion on how best to get the next NED or how to get on their own board because eventually in the UK you have to rotate off every, every nine years and if you've got three non-executive directors rotating off every three years, Soon there's going to be a vacancy. So you can start developing relationships that way. Um, but you have to be also quite open-minded about the opportunities. I think I would have been left on the shelf quite a long time if I was going to be completely entrenched in being in the travel industry only. The fact that I opened myself up to other industries and I was prepared to put the work in um, opened up opportunities. Um, you know, you have to thoroughly investigate the position you are discussing. So every time that I have get a, 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 a role description, I, I complete it almost as if it was a business school application. You know, I really do spend the hours to make sure that I, that I, I do the headhunter work for, the, for them, if you were, so that they don't need to m make up why I should be positioned or why I should be put forward as a candidate. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's good to take yourself out of your comfort zone, and, and, and it's important to stay current and agile. So right now I am trying to uh, position myself so that I am considered for uh, chair of remuneration committee, which, you know, after nine years would be a, a, a good natural step for me. So I am going to a lot of uh, sessions where they talk about remuneration and the new code and the new trends and, and what I need to be aware of and sort of I I exposing myself to investors so that, you know, I can claim with evidence that I've actually, I, I know the stuff, uh, stuff upstream. So you, you, you kind of start development before you get the role and then make sure that you keep developing. And that makes sense. And I think this also ties in with a larger perspective. And you talked about it earlier about you have to research the companies, the opportunities, their competitors. And it's a 
and being a Ned means you're doing constant reading, you're thinking, you're talking, you're yeah. networking with other people. And I know you were sharing with me before that one of the books you strongly recommend other people is, is Boards That Lead, right? Yes. Well, yes. I mean, that, uh, that, that book is great for many reasons. Uh, one, because it's one of the very few uh, books that actually um, is helpful for new chairmen uh, uh, on how to chair, because a lot of people become chair people, chairmen or chairwomen, without any training whatsoever. Somehow, uh, it's assumed that it's in your DNA, you're born with it or something. And as a net, I can tell you, working under a good chairman and working under one that's not so good makes a huge difference to your experience. So it's essential that you, you, you identify a good chairman if you can and try to work with them. And, and, and of course, uh, uh, what this book has is lots of tips on how to be a good chairman. And, and, and also what it has is, is lots of uh, uh, lists at the end to make sure that you, you don't forget all the good points that are made throughout the book. So that's why I like it. <laughs> well, Francesca, I feel like you've given us a lot of knowledge today and in many ways a key amount of information that our audience can take forward. And I'm sure there's some that are listening and thinking, I would love to be in touch with her to follow more about her career and learn and contact a bit more. What would be the right way for people to be in touch with you? So you can find me on the internet. Uh, so my name is Francesca Exery. You can either email me at Francesca at Exery.com or you can go to my website, which is Francesca Exery, one word, dot com. And there's a, a, a way of reaching me there. You can also find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Twitter. And so, yes, there's plenty of ways of getting hold of me. <laughs> Well, Francesca, we were delighted to have you on the show today, and thank you so much for sharing your insights and helping all of us to be boardroom-bound. Thank you. That's it for this episode of Boardroom Bound. I really enjoyed chatting with Francesca X-Ray. It was wonderful to hear someone who had been highly successful in their executive career, had built it intentionally over time, decided they want to be on board and realized, oh my gosh, I'm not ready, in the sense of, I've been doing so much busy work in my executive career, I have not facilitated, I've not laid the groundwork in order to be a board director. That network is essential. You could have all of the right materials. You could have your board bio ready, your your board resume ready, but that's a key component to it as well. It was great to hear from someone who'd been successful otherwise thinking, how do I go and start this new process? Now remember to head over to podcast.gordon.edu where you can get links to all of today's resources. And know that the Boardroom Bound team and I are so proud to be your go-to podcast for all things that connect, prepare, and empower you to land a board seat. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss any of the high-quality content we bring to you every Wednesday. And thanks for joining me today. I can't wait to share more stories and strategies from brilliant business minds with you again next week. Remember to keep tuning in to be Boardroom Bound.